Good morning again and, and welcome. Hope everyone is doing uh, well on this beautiful Sunday morning. I really appreciate the breeze and I'm, I'm sure compared to all the heat that we've been experiencing in the past week, you're, you're appreciating it also. Um, if you are viewing this morning, our service this morning online, um, we're delighted to have you worship uh, with us. Are there any announcements this morning that we'd like to lift up? No announcements. Well, I, I will mention the adult forum who typically meets on, on Sundays at 11 um, via Zoom. Uh, we'll be meeting it again at, at 11 o'clock. And, and those who typically participate in the adult forum, uh, the, the books for our, our next study have arrived. So I have um, placed them at the back of the sanctuary. So uh, please uh, know that they are available to you. Um, so I put them in there just, just this morning. So no birthdays or, or anniversaries, huh? Uh, Sandy. If you're starving for one, Tammy's birthday is this coming Friday. Okay. Well, yeah, yes, I'm starving for one. So pl please, uh, pl please extend a happy birthday to uh, Tammy this, this, this coming week. Okay. Well, if there aren't any other uh, announcements, let's uh, quiet our hearts and prepare ourselves for worship this morning. Please join me in the call to worship that's printed in your bulletin. Let us worship God. He is our refuge and our fortress, our God, who we trust. Let us confess with our mouths Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Let us call upon our true God believing him in our hearts, confessing him with our mouths, worshiping in spirit and in truth. Let us pray. Lord our God, we trust your promise to be among us as we gather. We come in the name of Christ, drawn by your spirit, eager to hear your word. Fill our hearts with your spirit and prepare us for faithful service. Amen. You may be seated. We know that nothing is able to separate us from the love of God 
in Jesus Christ. Let us in freedom confess the wrong we have done. Let us pray. Please join me in the prayer of confession in unison. Merciful God, you made us in your image with a mind to know you, a heart to love you, and a will to serve you. But our knowledge is imperfect, our love inconstant, our obedience incomplete. Day by day, we fail to grow in your likeness. In your tender love, forgive us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Listen to the words of assurance. There is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Through Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Amen.
Well, good morning. I'm always amazed at how they get so much sound with so little things out here. I never know where it's coming and different voices coming through, but thank you for be giving us that choir choral moment. Um, it was beautiful and a good reminder that it's God who saves us, so thank you so much for that. Our scripture text this morning comes from the Gospel of John, from Jesus' famous uh, last prayer, from John 17. Should you follow along with me as I read from God's holy word? My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought into complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory that you have given me because you have loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and they will continue to make you known in order that the love that you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. The word of the Lord. God, as we come to this uh, passage that may be familiar, but also has so much loaded into it and packed into it, Lord, help us to see, help us to understand. Lord, we ask that your spirit will give us eyes to, eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to believe. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So it was a number of years ago I got introduced to the idea of um, people first language or person first language. And I'm, I'm, I'm an old dog, so it's hard to learn new tricks sometimes, and I kind of forget these things. And so I was recently reconnected uh, with this idea. And if you're, if you're not familiar with what person first language is, uh, person first language is, is, is a type of linguistic prescription which puts a person before a diagnosis, describing what a person has rather than what a person is. I hope that clears that up. <laughs> so it's the intention of person first language is to avoid marginalizing or demonizing or dehumanizing a person for a condition or situation that they have or that they're in, right? Uh, whether it's conscious or subconscious, sometimes the, the language we use towards people can put the people, well, we can put them in the corner. We can put them on the do not call list. We can put them in the I'm going to be awkward around them list because of this condition that I've labeled them with. So the goal of person first language is to free people up to be seen first and foremost as people, as humans, whole people who may have a condition, who may have a, an adjective that might describe them, right? Uh, let me give some examples. Uh, Instead of saying that someone is handicapped or disabled, people first language says, oh, it's a person with disabilities. Instead of them being handicapped, they're a person who has some dis disability struggles, okay? Uh, instead of her being, instead of labeling, labeling her, she's autistic, she has autism or a diagnosis of autism. Instead of he's disturbed or mentally ill, he has a mental health condition or a mental health diagnosis. She's special ed. Maybe instead of saying she's just special ed and dismissing her, say she receives special education services. Now, for some of us, we might think, ah, oh, it's just yet again more word games trying to make language a little bit harder. To which I respond, sort of. It's more language games to make things a little bit better is the goal to be a little more accurate, to be a little more inclusive, to be a little more welcoming, to be a little bit shading it so that we remember the reality that they are indeed a person first, condition second. Person first language avoids using labels or adjectives 
defining someone or utilizing terms as a person with diabetes or a person with alcoholism instead of a person who's diabetic or an alcoholic. The intention is that the person is seen foremost as a person and only second as a person with some trait. There's a bunch of reasons for this and I think it goes a good way into including people into a whole community. And us as a church, I think there's a really good lesson that we can learn about that, about making sure that we recognize that we are brothers and sisters in Christ first. And then we can get to the things that are difficult or struggles that we have or disagreements that we might even identify with. There are criticisms, by the way. I don't want it to be left unsaid. I, I, I believe that there's a large community of the blind, com the blind community that rejects this. There's another community within the deaf community that says, no, we use deaf first language, since being culturally deaf is a source of positive identity and pride. They want to lead with that, and I understand that too. Um, there's uh, some within the autism community. Uh, one said, uh, autism activist rejects the first person first language on the grounds that saying a person with autism suggests that autism can be separated from the person. Identity first language is preferred by many autism organizations and those who run them. Well, the conclusion is, I'm not worried about whether or not the person first language is, as in, is the right choice in the right moment, as I am concerned about just the reminder that we see one another as people, whole people, not just a partial, not just an adjective, not just a description, not just a diagnosis. That's the real goal, to recognize the full humanity of each person and not re merely reduce them to an adjective. So I think that's a really wonderful cause. And it led me to ask another question. Could person first language apply to being a Christian? Are we people who follow Jesus? Are we best described as people who believe in Jesus? And so I thought I'd invite you with me to explore this question. So what is a Christian then? Who are we? What are we? Well, let's begin with Genesis 1. We're not going to go through the whole thing, by the way. I know the weather's nice. It's not that nice. <laughs> but Genesis 1, we were made in the image of God, right? Every human being, sinful or not, is made in the image of God. And Genesis 3 and Romans 3 reminds us that in this image has been broken. That we do have the capacity for sin, for, for, for anger, for hatred, for evil, for selfishness and greed. We have a capacity for sin and the generation of idols that continues on and on and on. So we are made in God's image, but we also like to make God in our image. It's kind of who we are. Skipping forward to uh, Ephesians, we find that once we heard the word of truth, the message of Jesus, the good news about Jesus, we heard, we believed, and we were marked and sealed with the Holy Spirit. So now, a person who's a Christian is a hearer and believer of the good news. They're marked with the Holy Spirit, and they're guaranteed a deposit. I think that's always an interesting verse, by the way, because you and I both know that technically in a world of, of guarantees and deposits, if someone tries to buy your house and then they, they renege on that deal, you get to keep the deposit, right? It never works out that way, by the way. I've had some really bad experiences with that. But this, let's just stick in the world of theory. So if God is going to renege on his promise of salvation and mercy and, and, and adoption of us, we get to keep the Holy Spirit. I'd say that's a pretty good deal. That's a pretty good assurance that God is going to be faithful. We've been marked and sealed, guaranteeing the Holy Spirit. We've crossed over from death to life, Ephesians 2 tells us. We, have, we who were far from God have now been brought near. And Ephesians 2 goes on to tell us that what God has been doing is calling out of the Jewish people and out of the Gentile people, which basically covers all humanity, God is pulling out and making a new humanity, a new humanity to be his people, to be his household. 
First, Second Corinthians 5 tells us that we in Christ are new creations. The old has gone, the new has come. And in the John 17 prayer that we just read, we are in Jesus and in the Father, just as the Father is in Jesus and Jesus is in the Father. Just as they are one, we who believe, we who heard and received Jesus, we are in God. There's kind of an interesting debate if you get into theological nerdy debates. I know not everybody does. I do get that. But I am one who does. And there's an interesting debate within the world of New Testament scholars. Should the phrase faith in Christ, pistis Christu, be in the Greek, and I rarely ever do that, by the way. We should mark that down. I actually said Greek, and I probably mispronounced it because I say it so infrequently. But the, the phrase faith in Christ, which goes throughout so many of the letters, so much of the New Testament, there's a debate. Is it, is it best to translate it faith in Christ or the faithfulness of Christ? And this is where some of you who don't get into these things check out and like, yeah, I, don't worry, we're not going to stay on this long. Bear with me. Because think about the difference of faith in Christ versus the faithfulness of Christ. If that Greek phrase can be translated properly, grammatically, both of those ways, well, which is it? And what are the implications? What, what are the implications of our faith in Christ, something we generate, something out of our agency, versus the faithfulness of Christ, something out of his doing, out of his agency. Do you see the difference? I think that brings us into this question about whether or not Christianity, being a Christian, is people first or not, or identity first. We can see this in Romans 3, Romans 6, Galatians 2, Philippians 3, the list goes on. Are we in Christ because of us, or are we in Christ because of God? And like I said, it may or may not be interesting to you, but the arguments can be made from both sides. And the implications are kind of far-reaching for our practice of life and faith. But let's not lose sight of what is clear. As Christians, we are in Christ. And when we are in Christ, this isn't like trying on a new outfit, a new shirt. This isn't a new identity. I remember a gentleman in eighth grade. I was, uh, I was in the band. I knew a lot, everyone in the band. I was part of the, in the 80s, we were called nerds. Now we're cool for playing Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> but there was a gentleman who, who played the French horn. And he went into Christmas break, a nerd. And he got a lot of gifts for Christmas and a new hairstyle, frosted tips, and started c carrying around a new, um, a new skateboard and wearing nothing but Powell Peralta t-shirts. Oli Midbo had a identity change. He went from being the awkward, nerdy French horn player to the kid carrying a skateboard around. And of course, everybody, like, we knew it was a transformation. It was a makeover. But sure enough, you see it for a couple weeks, and all of a sudden, you just think, ah, he's a skater. Is that our identity in Christ? A makeover? Is it that we're trying it on like a new shirt, a new identity, a new haircut with frosted tips? I don't think that's what the faith is. I don't think that's what the mark of the Holy Spirit is. I don't think that's what it means to follow Jesus, is to just try it on like a new identity. Let us not lose sight of what's clear. As Christians, we are in Christ. Something has happened to us. Something has changed. We are new. The scriptures tell us we're not the old Adam. We are close to God and to his people. We're not far, foreigners, aliens, enemies. We are adopted daughters and sons of the king. Think about that. We are adopted. The imagery of being in Christ is that we are adopted in 
and all the rights that come with being part of the family. The inheritance, the name, the access to the father, the access, you're no longer a servant, you're no longer a guest, you're no longer someone who has to schedule to come in. You just walk in because you live there. We are not enemies. We are forgiven. We're not slaves to sin and to death anymore. We are justified. We are not condemned. We are known. We are named. We are loved and sent. We are not alone and rejected. We are alive in Christ, the scriptures tell us. We have an intercessor who knows us, who understands what it's like to walk on this world. We have the Holy Spirit sealing us, filling us, leading us, guiding us, helping us know and hear the voice of God. We don't always hear it. We'd like to maybe, but we have the Holy Spirit present. We have hope. All this has changed in our being in our identity, in our nature. Something, the old has gone, the new has come. So I'd like to answer my question. Are we people who believe and follow Jesus? Are we people first? Identity second? Or are we Christians, new human, made and formed through the faithfulness of Jesus? I think we're the latter. I think in this case, Identity first describes best what it means to be a Christian. So why does this matter? I think it's crucial that you and I understand who we are in Christ Jesus. Who we are and whose we are changes everything. The more we know and the more we trust of what it means to be in Christ, we will learn to live freely within our new identity, within our new f natures, within our new freedoms. A few weeks ago, a friend of mine, there's a young man that grew up in my youth group 20 years ago. Now he's a 40-year-old man with four kids and our kids were running around nonstop. There was a lot of energy that day. He and I got up early and went to Mercer Park to go kayaking. We hit the water by 6 a.m. It was peaceful, it was nice. I just got to tell you that over the years of knowing this, this man, now 40-year-old man, I've known him since he was 14. This past year, he seems different. This past year, he seemed at peace with himself, at peace with his family and surroundings. He, he seemed at peace with a world that's filled with tension. He could have his opinions, but he didn't feel the need to fight them. He could have his ideas, but he didn't feel the need to push them. He seemed like he had a sense of peace and joy. So we're out on the lake. Perfect time for some meaningful conversations. Isaac, you seem a little, uh, you seem like you're in a better place. Well, in the Bible study that I was a part of, we've been really focusing on who we are in Christ. I think this year I started to really grasp who I am in Jesus and what changed. He's starting to taste that freedom of knowing that he's forgiven, that he's loved, that he's known, and that he has a place to serve one another, to serve his family, to serve his church, to serve his community. He doesn't have to win it over or beat it down or make it comply. He just gets to serve and he has the freedom of letting go and letting God be God. And he's at peace more than I've ever seen. He's actually more himself than he's been in 15 years. And it's been, it was a beautiful thing to see. And I love the fact that he took the time to highlight, well, the only thing that's changed, as a matter of fact, he just got let off his work, let off from work from 13 years of working at a company the, the week before, and he was at peace. He attributed it to knowing and understanding more of who he is and anchoring his identity in Christ. Isaac became more Isaac because of Jesus in him. 
Friends, this is my hope for myself. This is my hope for my family, that my kids, through being part of the church, will somehow grasp and see what it looks like to be in Christ, that they will see what it means to love their neighbor as a person who's in Christ, that they will see what it means to walk with a clear conscience, not because you don't do wrong, but because you've been forgiven. To walk in a community where you know you have neighbors who know you and love you and are there for you. Because you have a bond that you didn't choose, but that was chosen for you. So friends, it is my desire that you too, that together we, as this church community, will find the freedom of being in Christ. Not at war with ourselves or our neighbors or the people who think differently than us the people who may not be filled with that same joy and peace. May we be the ones to bring that light and goodness of the gospel into the world wherever it is that we walk. So be encouraged, friends. Know that you are in Christ. Trust in Jesus that he has and will continue to hold you and to transform you and to carry you into the work, finished work that he has started. Good news, God is faithful to complete what he's begun in you and me and us together. Amen. I think I hid the bulletin. Friends, as we respond now to what God has brought us through his word, the fact that he has included us, the fact that Jesus prayed for us 2,000 years ago, we, we read from that prayer today. I invite you now to join with me in praying for our, our community and for our church and for our world and also for the names and prayer requests. And I just want to remind you, if you don't know, I know some people are new, if you don't know about this sheet, please make sure that you fill out so that we can be praying for you, so that we can not only remember you here this morning during the service, but also throughout the week. Um, let us not be shy about asking one another to pray for the concerns that we have and the burdens that we're carrying and the hopes that we want to see. So let us be bold with our prayer requests. Would you join me in a time of prayer? Father, we do thank you that you hear us. We thank you that we are in you. Lord, we look at the relationship that Jesus, you had with your father and father that you had with your son. Not only do we want that, but Lord, you told us that we have that. So Lord, help us to trust today. Help us to believe, help us to rest in the reality that you have spoken into our lives. Lord, we thank you that we are transformed and changed into new people. Lord, I know that there's many days I feel like I need to be a new person. And thank you that you've adopted us into your family that even if we're having a bad day or a bad week, you don't kick us out of the family. Lord, we pray that the uh, world will desire this love, will desire this relationship, will desire this newness. We pray that they will hear the word and believe. Lord, we want to lift up our leaders, whether they be national leaders or local. We pray that they will rule um, with integrity and with justice in mind. We pray that their rulings will be um, for the good of the people. We pray that everyone that, that is in positions of power will be content with their station, will be content with their pay, and will look to serve their neighbor out of decency and good, if not love. Lord, we pray for those who are first responders. Lord, we want to lift up all the medical workers who are still in the hospitals being flooded and flooded. Lord, we pray for those, especially in the pediatric hospitals that are now receiving so many cases of children with COVID. And Lord, we pray for these children. Save them, Lord, rescue them, heal them. Lord, we pray that you would heal our country from the anger and division that we have. Help us to love one another and to do whatever we need to do to care for our neighbor. Lord, we want to pray for those who lead our state and those who lead our county and those who lead our towns. Lord, we thank you for the jobs that you've given us. We thank you for the provision of life that you've... 
Then, Lord, we want to lift up those who are looking for new jobs. Give them patience. Give them encouragement to know that you are with them and that you have not forsaken them. Lord, we want to pray for our parents. As those who are getting older, Lord, help us to care for them and make sure that they know that they are not forgotten. Lord, we pray for our children and our teachers as school is just a few weeks away. Lord, as they prepare, as they rest, as they rejuvenate over the summer, Lord, we pray that they would also be ready. We pray for the wisdom and what to do about masks in school. And we also just pray just for protection. We pray that we could get through this time and past it. Lord, we want to lift up those who are not well and who are going through difficult times. Lord, we want to pray for Frank and for Penny. We want to lift up Beth and Walt and Barbara and Ben. We remember Fred and Karen and Vince and his family. We pray for condolences for them as they deal with this time of loss. We lift up Kyle and Scott and Jean and Betty. We remember Josephine and Jean and Jimmy and Jacqueline and Kimmy and Debbie as well. Lord, for all these who have ailments, who are alone, who feel forgotten, Lord, comfort them and be with them. Lord, our heart cries out for the people of Afghanistan who are in war yet again and being taken over yet again by a ruthless dictatorship. We don't know what the solution is, God, but we cry out and ask for you to fix, you to save. Bring peace, Lord, to that land that's been stricken with violence. And Lord, we think of just south of us, for the people of Haiti who've just been decimated by, yet again, by another earthquake. Lord, be with their people. Be with the emergency workers. Be with all the, the humanitarian aid that's going to come in, but may it be good. May it be d done to help the people and not just provide a Band-Aid. We ask for mercies on those who've lost their families, who've lost loved ones this week and this day. Lord, there's so many prayer requests that we have, so many heavy burdens that when we look around, it can cause us to look at the storm and forget that you're the one that tells us to walk. So Lord, we come back to you and close our time of prayer, remembering the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those Amen. That is my greatest nightmare, is to always mess up one line of the Lord's Prayer, and then it's derailed from that point on. <laughs> it's not the first, and I know it won't be the last. But you never look cool after it. And so there's, thank you all for carrying on with me and, in my, and for me. Um, one of the things I just want to remind you is that, again, we still are taking our tithes and offerings, and it, it's an act of worship. There's a box right over there. A lovely. Did, did someone make that box for us? So, somebody bought it? I bought it online too. I would have loved for you to have so, Oh, yeah, Carl, he just, he just got in the wood shop there. I, mean, I, was, I Honestly, I was expecting someone to have, like, I carved that out of a single piece of wood, you know. But we don't have that story. But still, that lovely purchase box over there is where we can still worship God through our giving. You can also go online. You can also send checks and, uh, and your, your tithes to 2020 Brunswick Avenue. Uh, Lawrence, New Jersey. No matter what you're doing, every time you do it, don't, just remember it is, since we're not doing it in the worship service, remember that it is still your act of worship God. And let us be grateful for what God has given us. Let us be grateful for the, uh, the provision and our jobs that we have. And so when we give back, let us uh, do it joyfully. Would you pray with me as we just thank God for his blessings? God, we thank you that you have provided. We thank you for the gifts that are given. We thank you for the ministry of this church for, for, for us, to us and to our neighbors and to our families. But Lord, we also thank you for the ministry of this church to the community. We pray that you will multiply what is given to provide for what you need and want to do here. But Lord, we also thank you not just for the money that's been given, but for the time and the energy and the gifts of the people that make up this community, this body that, you, that are called by your name. We thank you, Lord. We ask that you'd be honored with these gifts. And please, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. At this time, I'd like you to invite you to stand as we close. Sing our, yes, ma'am. 
There we go. George Dunn is a name. True or not, it doesn't matter. We're going to go with it. <laughs> Love it. Would you all join with me in, as we sing our closing hymn? can't help but think that Shelly knew I needed something with very few words <laughs> to remember. Friends, as we go from this place, this beautiful day, let us remember that we are in Christ because Christ called us to be with him. Remember that he is the one to make us into a new humanity. We don't have to perform to please Papa to be loved. He called us, he knows us, so let us go and be the people of love, be the people of peace, be the people of Jesus, because he is in us, and we are in him. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling, he's the one who's able to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be majesty and glory and power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Friends, go in peace. <laughs>